Fed ramp the other F word because let's face it, it is. Fed ramp ready and listed in the marketplace. Fed ramp really focuses on your cloud service providers. Thou shalt leverage Fed ramp. If you are Fed ramp ready. Yes, you've got my seal of approval. I'll stop Gabby, there. Gabby, breathe. Breathe. I can't, I can't. I'm so passionate about it. I get hype. What can I say? Hello, welcome to the first in a string of webinars put on by MindPoint Group and Earthling Security. The name of this series is FedRamp, the other F word, because let's face it, it is. So we're here to discuss exactly how FedRamp affects your business, what the changes have been over the past couple of years, and how that's going to affect organizations like yourselves going forward. I'm Michael McPherson. I'm the Executive Vice President for Business Process Development for Earthling Security. Along with me, I have Gabriella Smith-Sherman from MindPoint Group. She is an absolute incredible asset and uh, the greatest head of hair known in one time. <laughs> Thank you. And we have Joshua Marquette here from Earthling Security who will be answering a number of the questions that I put forward here and, and hopefully doing a decent job. Uh, he, he is a, an absolute professional despite that ridiculous look. Uh, so we're, we're here to go ahead and, and get started. So the first thing is I want Gabriella and Josh to introduce themselves. So Gabriella, obviously ladies first. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriella Smith Sherman here. I am the governance risk and compliance, uh, director here at MindPoint group overseeing both our federal and commercial sectors. Uh, I am an Army veteran. I have been um, in the federal civilian service working uh, across many of the CFO Act agencies and a handful of the smaller agencies as well. Uh, most notably, my, my last Fed position, I had the opportunity to serve as a CISO and Chief Privacy Officer for a small federal bank um, before joining MindPoint Group. And I have been with MindPoint now for about a little over two years now um, and kind of love all of the work that we do here. Uh, but particularly, I get the opportunity to oversee our FedRAM 3 PAO um, and have a bunch of good information to share since I've had the opportunity to serve in so many different capacities um, within the FedRAM realm, right? Supporting on the federal side, supporting um, on the contract side, and now as a 3 PAO. So I look forward to giving you a little bit more about my two cents on FedRAM. Josh? I think it's a little bit more than two cents, Gabby. But, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I have to say that uh, Mike introduced you as the best head of hair in the business, and it's true, but I really can't compete. I'm sorry. You know, it's just the way it is. <laughs> well, it's beautiful. You know, nonetheless, we've got to have balance, right? I think I've this got to be in the whole department. This works. So, anyway, let me introduce myself uh, Josh Marpet. Um, I am the VP of regulatory strategy for Earthling. Basically, I'm the guy that goes, oh, look, new regulations. Let's figure out how to meet these, okay? And work with uh, all of our clients. Since we're also a 3PAO, a 3PAO, third-party assessment organization, uh, we work with CMMC, uh, FedRAMP, uh, basically 800 If it's a government compliance regime, we're there, same as MindPoint Group. Uh, I'm also a, a B-Sides conference organizer. I run B-Sides Delaware. I'm on the board of B-Sides DC. I'm on the global board of the B-Sides Council. Uh, I'm an INS faculty member. Um, good Lord. I do a lot of different things. I helped write CMMC. Uh, I helped write SPDX, which is a software bill of material standard uh, for the Linux Foundation. Uh, I have a lot of fun. What can I say? And I have two small children, so occasionally I sleep. It's an amazing concept. What's that? Who needs sleep? <laughs> no, this, is, this is the first time Josh has been healthy in about 10 weeks here from all the uh, daycare plagues that that's a little actually true. Long. Yeah. All right. So yeah. you, you mentioned something. I think it's uh, it, it's very important for us here to sort of level set and both uh, Gabriella, MindPoint Group, as well as uh, Josh, myself with Earthling. We are three pounds. Uh, so. Gabriella, would you like to sort of just walk us through what a three pow is, just to sort of level set who we are and, and the, the point of view and perspective that we're bringing to the table? All right. So what is the three pow? First of all, it is a third party assessor organization. Um, and what does that mean? So there are requirements in order for an independent third party assessor organization to meet FedRAMP. And that means that, um, one, you also have to be compliant with a couple 
couple of uh, ISO CMMI processes and procedures um, in accordance with all of the great audit standards. And then for FedRAMP, you also have to have people that are certified meeting certain criteria for different levels and types of positions. They have to have certain certifications and bodies of powers, a bunch of independent training for kind of continuous monitoring. Um, and then you also have to go through what we call Baltimore Cyber Range, which is the certification process to become an actual assessor, which also includes a, ten, a team of pen testers. What does that mean? We are certified and authorized independent assessors that can come in and perform certain audit standards. Um, we can do most federal audit standards with the exception of financial because we are not a CPA. Uh, some financial and um, audit organizations do have that and offer that service. However, it is not a minimum requirement for you to be a three pal. Josh, am I missing anything? I think you covered just about everything. I mean, the, the bringing the Baltimore Cyber Range in, most people forget that. Well done. Uh, it's 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 a significant amount of work to get your company up to three pal status. It's a significant amount of work to to continue to meet all those compliance standards. It's not exactly what you might call fun. Uh, it is uh, you're scrutinized constantly, and there's not many companies that do it. Uh, there, there's what? Uh, how many three pals are there? There's. Uh, 30 something? Yeah, 30 or 40. I was going to say like 40, but 30 or 40 sounds about right. Yeah. And for every federal cloud service provider or cloud service provider that provides anything to the federal government, there's a lot of them out there. So it's it's a interesting interesting sort of ratio, if you will. By the way, if you put it into some context, I, and I think the number, I'll take it back, I think it's 42. Um, so 42 three POWs that are authorized to provide this service, and there are now just over 300 FedRAMP authorized services. Congratulations to the FedRAMP PMO oh, on nice. getting all of those through and all of the different three POWs that support that. But as you can see, it's like a super competitive business and process, not only for the cloud service providers, but then for those of us that support that process in ensuring that you meet the federal uh, guidelines and compliance standards needed for cybersecurity. All right. So, you know, great segue, uh, both Gabriella and Josh, you know, obviously three pound third party assessment organization, we're assessing and assisting organizations to meet the FedRAMP standards. Now, uh, maybe Josh, you can kick this off. Can we define really for the, the viewing audience out there, just a, a quick summation, what is FedRAMP? Why is it important? How does this how does this touch the business? And then we'll we'll get Gabby's take on it because she is the FedRAM queen. Oh, she she's going to go much more detail. I'm going to do the very very high level, uh, and then she can detail it out. Effectively, Mike, your question is what is FedRAMP like? Why do why do we care? What is it FedRAMP about? And and FedRAMP is really a, a set of security controls and standards to make sure that a cloud service provider, whether it's a, a cloud like AWS giving you a cloud machine or a SaaS application that you may use. If you're a cloud service provider to the federal government, you have to meet the FedRAMP standards in order to be authorized to operate ATO in the federal sort of universe, if that makes sense. So the, the importance of this is that what we're saying is, hey, for you to provide this cloud service, this uh, whether it's a, a SaaS application, a, a EC2 machine or Azure or GCP or whatever, you have to meet these security standards so we can make sure that the data is protected. We can make sure that the workflows are protected. The identities are protected. We can make sure that every aspect of that cloud service is in a protected world. Okay, so uh, Gabby, I mean, I just did the very high level sort of simplified definition of FedRAMP. If you don't mind, can you go into the details of it? Uh, where did it come from? And uh, what is it about? Sort of the definition in detail. Certainly. So all FedRAMP is FedRAMP is a requirement that establishes minimum standard baselines for all cloud service providers to follow, meaning that the cloud service providers that are going to perform and conduct business within the federal government must meet the minimum standards for your NIST controls. It establishes and reaffirms um, the risk management framework the need for an independent uh, third-party assessor to come and perform the validation of those controls to ensure that you're actually meeting the compliance standard for the specific environments that you are hosting data in. And that could mean things such as whether you have 
you as persons that touch your data, um, how quickly you release your data and the types of uh, service offerings, whether they are FedRAMP compliant or not. Um, we used to have a minimum requirement that said you had to go through this process that allowed for an assessment that um, basically assessed the level of risk. And in order for the uh, commercial vendors to really kind of understand those federal government and guidelines, FedRAMP was really established to reinforce and establish them, enforce the hand at portion of acquisition clauses and laws to ensure that your government service providers are meeting all of those minimum requirements. And what better way to do that than develop regulation, policy, and mandates and guidance to do it? Uh, that really forces the hand for your uh, Microsofts of the world uh, and plenty of the other great leading tools to ensure that they're meeting those minimum standards and guidelines and that you have a three power to come in and assess and validate those so that all of our government entities are procuring safe solutions and securing all of our data. Fantastic, Gabrielle. That was such a such a good outline of what it really is. And and Josh, you did okay too. Aw, <laughs> you're so sweet. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so the, the reality is, you know, these are sets of regulations that must be abided by by all of the organizations, cloud security providers, as well as application providers that are service, servicing the federal government. And this is obviously very, very important. Uh, but up until up until recently, it wasn't exactly law. So we had the National Defense Authorization Act of 2023 that actually made FedRAMP the law. And there's an executive order in there, which we will discuss in time. Uh, but I'd like one of you to just sort of uh, take that and roll with it. What does it mean now that FedRAMP is law? It, it, what What's changed? How is that, how is that affecting businesses? And what, what does that really mean to companies that, that may be watching here? Well, let's just think about it in the context of all law. What does that mean? You must follow the law, which means thou shalt have FedRAMP authorized services when leveraging for any type of federal, state, tribal, or local government that has a standard. There is a corresponding state ramp, by the way, uh, which we can definitely speak more on in another portion of our series. Um, but to focus on FedRAMP, right, it mandates that anytime someone within the federal government wants to procure, leverage, or put data, store, transmit, share, receive data, it must be hosted in a FedRAMP authorized cloud service provider environment, meaning that the risk has been uh, determined appropriate, assessed, and has been validated by, again, your lovely three pals. Um, and all of that information is then managed, maintained, and made available via your continuous monitoring process so that your uh, government entities understand the level of risk associated with all of their data that's being hosted in the cloud. No more risk acceptance and leveraging unapproved vendors. You can choose to sponsor a vendor through the process, um, which I know we'll definitely cover a little bit more uh, in detail in a few minutes, but definitely thou shalt leverage FedRAMP authorized services from here on out. So Fed, FedRAMP is now the law, okay? And, you know, basically what that, what that means is, you know, from, from going from a suggestion it's now an absolute and you must be FedRAMP compliant in order to do business with the federal government. Now, Josh, you mentioned something or, or, or Gabriella uh, about sponsorship. And I think that's important because it needs to be understood. How does one go through the path of FedRAMP? How do you, how do you go from, I want to sell my, I want to sell my services to the federal government to I can sell the Fed, the services to the federal government. And is there a, a step in between? I think I heard roar or something like that at one point. Rawr. Can we... <laughs> okay. Can we, can we, so uh, let me take this. Maybe, just... maybe uh, walk us through that a little bit. Sure. Happy to. So, you know, FedRAMP is an investment. Be taking a, a product or service and making it FedRAMP compliant, ATO, authorized to operate in the FedRAMP universe, if you will, does cost money. It co takes effort and time and money. So how do I know that I, I, I can do this and get a contract with it and move forward with it and make money on this whole thing enough to make it to where it's worth this investment? 
And the answer to that is they, they made it actually not horribly hard. Uh, there's multiple steps in between. You can take your product or service, go through and do a, a obviously you can self-assess against the standard, make sure that you're, you know, you're pretty comfortable that you're ready. And you can do what's known as a FedRAMP ready or a, a RAR readiness assessment. And so what you can do is have a, a, a three power, a, a good organization come by and do a FedRAMP ready assessment for you. Are we actually compliant with all of the FedRAMP standards and controls? If the answer is yes, you can be deemed FedRAMP ready. And there's a process for that. I know Gabby's probably like, oh my God, there's more steps to this, but bear with me for a second. I'm trying to make it simple here. And uh, so you can be FedRAMP ready and listed in the marketplace. And that's the important piece. If you are FedRAMP ready, you can be listed in the marketplace. You're not authorized to operate, but that's the place where you can go to a potential sponsor agency and go, hey, you need this service. You've put out a, a requisition for it. We have the service. If you'd like to sponsor us, we're already FedRAMP ready. It's not going to take much to get us there. Would you like to work with us to get us there? Because we're going to give you the best deal. We're going to do the right thing. We're going to take good care of you, et cetera. And that's the way that you move from, we don't know what we're doing to we're authorized to operate. There's a, there's a step in the middle there. Gabby, please feel free to elucidate. Great. So there are two paths to becoming FedRAMP authorized. One is the agency sponsorship process, which we kind of just went over. Essentially, that means you have to be a service that a federal agency is using um, in a pilot capacity, right, or a testing capacity, uh, or have a relationship established. And that agency has the responsibility to sponsor you through the process, meaning you as a vendor must go through the assessment process. You must have all of your policies and procedures documented. Um, you can do that yourself. You can hire an organization to do that on your behalf. And then you can go through the three POW uh, independent assessment portion of the process where you have a FedRAMP assessor, they come in, they um, conduct the assessment against all of the various controls in your baseline, low, moderate, or high. Um, whether you have PII or not. And then they also conduct a pen test, close out the report. That information goes back to your sponsoring agency. And this is why it's important. That agency also has a responsibility to authorize the portion of controls that they are responsible for, whether they are wholeheartedly inherited, um, they must look at the level of risk they are inheriting from you as a CSP. Uh, whether there are hybrid and shared controls that they have a responsibility to implement, such as account management, um, a little bit of incident response, right? Making sure that there's notification, meeting all of those minimum standard requirements or things that they are holistically responsible for. Now, once they complete their authorization package, as well as the uh, independent uh, assessment has been completed and your FedRAMP authorization package is ready for FedRAMP PMO, the um, pro program management office, uh, they conduct a review of the overall package and ensure that it's meeting the federal standards and guidelines. You've implemented all of the critical security controls, and then you can be granted your authorization and post it out on the marketplace. That is the most popular path for organizations to kind of get their foot in the door into the federal government and being a FedRAMP authorized cloud service provider. The secondary path is what you call a JAB authorization. This is the Joint Authorization Board, which is comprised of GSA. Um, we've got uh, a little bit of DOD. I think we've got some uh, DHS slash CISA that sit on the board and review uh, packages that go through a very similar process to what I just described. However, these products are uh, typically reviewed, I think only 12 vendors get selected um, to go through this process per year. It is a little bit more arduous to go through that step because um, you do have your independent review that's done by your C your uh, three pal. Um, and then you have to go through the kind of waiting game to go through the jab process and they serve as the oversight body as opposed to the FedRAMP PMO. And then there is no um, additional interaction from a sponsoring agency to go through that process. Uh, this can take a little bit more time. And typically I would recommend this process is uh, used for those types of products that are a little bit more mature and have a broad spread within the federal government, meaning you have multiple customers to get through that process because you do wanna have that um, large kind of interest in body. 
So I typically recommend people to go through the sponsorship process or the agency process if you're kind of just getting started and you have um, a customer that's very interested in using you. Excellent. All right. So th there's a number of topics I want to cover, but we're going to keep it in line with the, the FedRAMP is the law uh, sort of statement here is that sort of the, the encompassing, uh, you know, theory for this for this webinar. Uh, so in addition to the National Defense Authorization Act of 2023, there was an executive order, 14028, uh, that spoke about a, a broad number of subjects relating to national security specific to the cyber world. And there, there are a number of instances within this that have affected the FedRAMP journey. Can we speak a bit to what 14028 has really done to, to shift the journey of FedRAMP organizations and, and how companies might navigate this now? You know, I'd like to take that for just a second and sort of a sidetrack. Um, I think 14028 was important for a lot of reasons. FedRAMP is one of them and a big one, don't get me wrong, but I think 14028 really put a lot of government contractors and the DIB, the Defense Industrial Base, on notice that not only is cybersecurity going to be taken very, very seriously from now on in the government contracting world, but that there's a lot of different things they're going to be required to do. Uh, it brought out SBOM, Software Bill of Materials. It brought out Zero Trust. It brought out FedRAMP. It brought out, and so many things they were told, uh, by the way, you're going to be doing this and we're going to be taking it seriously and there's going to be significant sanctions. And I think that was the time, I, I believe when they introduced that, somebody went False Claims Act uh, because it was, well, you know, we, we've already done this. And I, I, I was laughing when I heard that because honestly, I mean, I'm, I'm going to bring back a little history. Uh, December 31st, I think it was 2018, don't quote me on that, was when every federal government contractor was supposed to be 100% compliant with NIST 800-171. By my personal anecdotal guess, this is non-scientific, this is just anecdotal information, maybe single digit percentages of federal government contractors were compliant with 800-171 to any significant amount, okay? Hopefully I won't get sued there, I didn't name anybody, but irrespectively, uh, the point is, is that uh, 14028 and a, a couple of other things around that time period, which is continuing, by the way, have really put the federal government contracting world on notice. Not only are we taking cybersecurity seriously, not only are we going to be checking, and there's CMMC in there as well, but uh, there's going to be some significant sanctions. Well, let's let's take some key words here when we're talking about 14028. The purpose is to improve the nation's cybersecurity. So that's not just holding our contracts and our vendors accountable. That's also holding the federal government accountable for Ooh. implementing and meeting all of these standard guidelines, right? Good Zero point. trust isn't just for the vendors. This is for us to take this very old architecture that we've been trying to modernize over time uh, going to more mature standards, right? Implementing your zero trust, right? We used to be trust but verify. Now I trust no one. I want to make sure that all of my stuff is secure. What does that mean? There are tons of pillars, minimum requirements, and all kinds of different technology that has to go into that. We're looking at identity, right? We're looking at software devices. We're looking at supply chain, which is another huge item that's highlighted in 14028. We're going to reaffirm and hold people to meeting these standards because a lot of this stuff is not new, right? We've had multi-factor authentication has been a requirement since FISMA 2002, right? Yeah. A lot of people have not still implemented it. They've had POEMs open for this for years. Now the government is saying, if you're going to do business with us, you must meet these minimum requirements. And if you cannot, then you're not allowed to play our game. And I love the fact that we're making that stance and holding people accountable. And that is part of the deal of making FedRAMP the law, right? That thou shalt, again, Gabriella with her draconian statements, but that's exactly what we're trying to do in modernizing this and having the law and the president focusing on this just tells you how important it really is to hold us all accountable to include private sector, because this is also going to touch many lives outside of just the federal government. Um, but honestly, like that, that's the whole point of compliance. That's our, that's our job, right? I want to come in here, check behind you. I'm not just here to be the bad guy. Everyone hates this portion of cybersecurity. It's not the most sexy part of cyber, if you will. 
right? No one wants to be checked for the rules, but we have to have those checks and balances in place. We need to ensure that we're validating the controls that are mandated and required to prep, protect all of our data, right? This is this is all kind of services, whether we're ordering supplies or protecting someone's personally identifiable information, all of that stuff has to be secure. And what better way to do it than to have checks and balances and validate that that's really what's happening. That's how we mitigate risk. I, I, okay. So Gabriella, you, you said something uh, very poignant there, and that's that we're not here to come in and be the bad guy. And, you know, to some extent that's true. And, and some am. of that, some of that extent, it's not. Uh, so, and what I mean by that is there's a three pal advisory and then a three pal actual audit. Now the three pal audit is meant to not be the bad guy, but to ensure adherence, right? Well, let's talk a little bit about the difference between these two inactions, right? In other words, it, what what is advisory and, and whose side are they on? And what is what is an audit and whose side, if there is a side, are they on? Okay. Um, so when you do FedRAMP or when you do CMMC or when you do SOC 2 or when you do whatever, it doesn't matter. There's somebody that helps you get ready. And then there's somebody that actually holds you accountable to the standard. Okay. And they should not be the same group because you should not check your own work. It's really that simple. All right. That's why when you take a test in, in high school and you pass it over to the person next to you to grade, because you shouldn't grade your own work, right? Somebody else grades it. That's how we maintain accountability. And that's how we maintain integrity. So uh, advisory is I'm going to come in and I'm going to get you ready to be assessed, ready to be audited, ready to be held accountable to that standard. All right. But then the other side of the coin is then some other company is going to come in and some companies do like, oh, well, they're different divisions of the same company. I'm sorry, I'm old fashioned. I don't like that. It should be a different company that comes in and says, all right, now we're going to check that you're actually doing what you say you're doing. We're going to check that it meets the, the definition of the standard, that your artifacts, your evidence that you're doing it has sufficient adequacy and sufficiency to perform to task and standard that you are doing what you should be doing and doing it the right way. And that's the audit or assessment. Technically, it's an audit only if it's a CPA. So like SOC 2 is done by CPAs, those are auditors. Everybody else, it's an assessment. But either way, at the end of the day, they should be giving you effectively a gold star, a little ribbon, you know, a certificate. Yay, okay, I did whatever. It. Exactly. Okay, I wanna clarify one thing, right? Please. Your advisor and your assessor cannot be the same organization at all. Doesn't matter if they're separate, managed separately within the organization, right? You clearly cannot advise because that creates a conflict of interest as well as doing the assessment. Um, to Josh's point, right? I cannot check myself because I'm going to get credit. I am perfect and amazing. I'm not going to tell you my faults. I meet all of the requirements. And yes, it is true. I am perfect and amazing. I However, was going to say, Gabby, I mean, come on, let's be clear. It's the government doesn't accept it I, unless you I, I come in and independently verify that I'm amazing. But someone has to verify it, not just take my word. Gabby, I verify that you're perfect and amazing. Thank you. It goes on the marketplace. That's all I needed. It's official. Um, but yes, right. absolutely. So you have your advisory services and that can mean a lot of things. But for most people, your advisory is the documentation development, right? You can uh, have them come and do a gap assessment, right? Determine the level of maturity. Have you met all of the minimum requirements? Are you ready to go um, and, and get you, you know, up to snuff for your actual assessment? Your assessor, however, right? They're going to come in. They're going to do that assessment. They're going to look at your controls. They're going to ensure that everything is done in accordance with validate all of that good stuff. They're going to bang out a pen test, making sure that they've actually technically um, validated that those controls are in place and meeting everything as intended, as documented within your SSP, your system security plan, and those implementation statements that list, this is how I do those wonderful things. Those are two very distinct services. Um, last but not least, the other service that you always get once you are FedRAMP authorized is you have to do your continuous monitoring assessments. So you still need a 3 pal to help you go through that process. And an advisor can help you in the event that you're looking to make a significant change and going through the SCR significant change request process 
uh, and making updates to your controls or in the likely event that you've got Rev 5 coming up, you need to figure out how to address that. You might go and work with an advisor to help you through that process. So I want to point one thing out that I think is interesting and a lot of people don't get. It's actually harder to be an advisor than an assessor. And the reason I say that, it, it, don't get me wrong, assessment is, is not fun. It's, it's very difficult. It's very detail oriented. Uh, and, and you have the liability of I'm actually giving them the gold star, the stamp of approval, the, the, the ready to be ATO type thing. OK, but the advisor has to do a lot more work. What do I mean by that? Let, let, let me give you one quick example. An advisor has to come in and say, OK, show me all your firewall logs for the year. And they have to go through everything. The assessor comes in and shows, says, show me April's. They, they, t they pick a random sampling. Whereas the advisor has to write your documentation, potentially, has to check every single artifact, every piece of evidence, everything to make sure that it's done properly. OK, and if they're doing a random sampling, they're doing a very heavy random sampling. The assessor comes in and can do a lighter random sampling because you don't know what they're going to ask for. So that random sampling can be actually a light random sampling of artifacts to determine whether you're up to par. So it's, it's interesting. And people are like, why are you charging me this much for advisory? But the three pals only charging me this much for the actual assessment. It's because there's a lot more work in advisor. Yeah. And not yeah. only and that, Josh, I'm an advisor. I get you to say random sampling just one more time, because I don't think we got that in there enough. <laughs> in <the> last... <sighs> random <I'm> sampling. <laughs> from a random sample, um, <laughs> right? The, the advisor has the opportunity to do a whole lot more in supporting your customer, <clears throat> whereas the assessor is really there just to do your assessment. An advisor can help you, you know, figure out uh, who is going to be your sponsor. They can tell you what is your compliance roadmap. Do I need SOC 2 compliance? Do I need FedRAMP? Do I need state ramp? They can help you kind of navigate your path, right? Whereas that assessor, they're very black and white. You know, did you meet this at the determined if statement level? Yes, no. You know, there's no gray area in the assessment activity. So there's a there's a great comparison that I've heard, you know, it's kind of like getting your license for FedRAMP. You have driving school where you spend months going through everything and then you have your driver's test. The driver's test doesn't check everything, but the driving school better damn well make sure that you know everything. Yeah. Okay. So we we spoke a little bit about uh the cloud security providers, and I'm sorry, cloud service providers, uh, your your Googles, your Azure's, your AWS, your Rackspace, and and the list goes on. What is can we can somebody define to me sort of the 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 shared security model? How how that exactly works? What is if I if I am building an application? on a FedRAMP approved Amazon GovCloud or, or something to that respect, does that just mean that my, I can just sell my, my application to the federal government? No. So just because you're leveraging um, infrastructure as a service of a FedRAMP authorized uh, provider, like, you know, you're in AWS, IAS, right? Um, that doesn't mean you're FedRAMP authorized. That means the environment that you're hosted in is authorized. Your application still has to go through that authorization process. However, you do inherit um, the authorization for, and the controls of being in that hosted environment. So that means you're one step closer um, to meeting the, the minimum requirements Right, but still at every application level, your SaaS offering still has to go through that. Um, there is just a little bit of a reduction in the controls that you technically are responsible for at the SaaS level. Um, so there are three different levels of service that um, you know can be provided within in the cloud uh, terminology. Right, you're going to inherit from your infrastructure as a service, your platform as a service, or you are a SaaS software as a service provider. And based off of those, you're going to have different level of controls that you inherit from each provider, which identifies you as the vendor or you as the customer, what controls you inherit in from whom and what controls you're responsible for administering yourself. You know, this is um, the analogy that I always use is the pizza place. And I think we've all seen that analogy for, for the SaaS, IS, and PaaS 
providers, which is uh, there's a stack. There's the oven, there's the waiter, there's the table, there's the flatware, there's the napkins, there's the pizza, there's heating the pizza, there's serving the pizza, there's where do you sit to eat the pizza. And some of this is done at home if you're, if you, if you're take and bake pizza. Some of this is done at the pizza place if you actually go to a pizza restaurant, you know, that kind of thing. And each of these levels is a different level or different line of responsibility. If you're running a SaaS offering, the everything is yours. Okay, you handle all of it. But if you're running a SaaS offering on top of, say, AWS, AWS is handling some of that, you're handling some of that, and your client has to handle almost none of that. Okay, if you're running an IaaS, an infrastructure as a service, your client has to handle almost everything, and you're just handling sort of the hardware and the firmware beneath them, beneath their application. So that shared responsibility model is has to be documented for every cloud service provider. Because every, we have to know who is handling the FedRAMP ATO for each level of your tech stack, okay? And a lot of people, for example, I'll give you an example, uh, uh, in SOC 2, they're like, well, I'm in a SOC 2 certified data center, therefore I'm SOC 2 certified. And I'm like, no, your data center SOC 2 certified, Are you, but you're the data custodian. You're the one handling the data of your clients. Uh, the way you're handling that data, have you gone through the SOC 2 certification process? And they're like, oh, Never thought about it that way. So uh, an, an it's an artificial distinction. It's one I started making is that there's a data center and a data custodian who is in charge of those pieces really makes a difference into what types of uh, controls you need to wrap around what you're doing and what your providers need to wrap around what they're doing. So there's been a lot of talk about controls and, uh, you know, I, I think maybe it can be a bit confusing to people. Can we really define what we mean by controls, control sets, control families, and how those are baked into the FedRAMP infrastructure? Uh, what you do is you take the FedRAMP manual, 853, you put it under your pillow and you sleep on it. And uh, every night that you sleep on it, you get another control family osmosed into your brain. <laughs> That's how come so, I have so much hair. <laughs> that's how come I have so little hair, okay? Let's be clear on this. Okay. Is, is so, there potentially another way to do it aside from sleeping on the FedRAMP manual? Yeah, please don't. It will help you go to sleep, though. Um, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it, will, it will hurt your neck if you're sleeping on it, though. I mean, for oh, sure. Yeah. But just read it, and you'll be out cold in like three seconds, I swear to God. Absolutely. So FedRAMP follows the NIST framework, right? The risk management framework is the basis. And we leverage the NIST special publication 853. Uh, today, the FedRAMP minimum baseline requirement is Rev 4. Uh, for the rest of the federal government, it is Rev 5. Uh, some people are in transition between the two. Uh, eventually, we will all be in sync at Rev 5. But this, this publication identifies uh, several in the Rev4, several policies and controls, 18 control families, such as account management, um, audit management, incident response, right? All of your core cybersecurity control families and functions. And then they define cybersecurity controls within that. So you may have, um, you know, all of your control families at the dash one level focus on the policy and procedure. Uh, you know, your dash twos are gonna focus on the implementation of the minimum requirement. Uh, and those are identified as your cybersecurity or your policy controls that must be documented and assessed against. That defines your baseline against multiple um, watermarks, if you will, for your FIPS 199 categorization, which defines the type of data that's managed and contained within your system. And the categorization tells me the watermark and level of security controls that are required at each baseline. And those correspond to uh, low, moderate, or high based off of the data types that are managed, stored, transmitted within your system. Oh, that's, that's Gabby, it's when you go through the details like that, it is so nice. You, you lay them out so beautifully. I got to tell you that. Yeah. So going through those control families, going through the, 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 the base, the source documentation from where all of these controls live from or, or, or are born from is, is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and she's 100% right. These are standardized manuals that are honestly really easy to read. They will put you to sleep. I'm not going to lie. But they're very easy to read. And if you're like, well, I'm low here and mod here. Okay, here's the base control. Then if you add this, you're at moderate. If you add this, you're at high. It's not hard to understand, okay? 
I swear, like I, I, I literally know people that say, you want to do compliance? Can you read? You're good. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's a simplification. But these control sets, these security sets are set up so that everybody can understand them from business people to technologists. And the technologists have to worry about how do I implement that? And the business people have to worry about which ones, where do I need to be, low, moderate, high? But we can all discuss using those as a, as a, as a framework to talk about. It. And it, it works out really well. Well, it's, it's great when you have a guy that's been in the industry for like 80 years tell you it's easy to read. Um, the, those, <laughs> those of us that, that hadn't been in the industry for, you know, two and a half lifetimes may not find it that easy. Uh, but <laughs> you see what I have to deal with, Gabby? Do you see what I, I deal do. with on a daily basis? I do. I do. Uh, I will say it is not the easiest of jobs to read tons of policy and then be able to understand and interpret um, from a technological standpoint how those things are implemented. Again, that like advisory service is super important to help you understand that. Um, I, I love working with engineers and developers, but they love to code. They love to solve problems. They don't necessarily always think about it of what are the guardrails that I have to I have to follow in order to make sure that it's done properly. They have satisfied your solution. Uh, and that's why having your advisor, your ISO, your, uh, your information system security officer or your ISO help you through that process so that you understand and you guys are all on the same page of, uh, you know, making sure that we're doing those checks and balances or documenting how you have implemented that control. And then we go in and we validate it. And you have to have kind of full life cycle support in order to do that. Uh, successfully. And, and that allows us to work, you know, really well together with the different parts of cybersecurity and IT uh, and tie it very nicely into the business process to be able to give you your traditional return on investment via the FedRAMP authorization. I want to, I want to say something really, really important here. And I, I love the way you put that Gabby about how this allows us to do business and security. That's the clash of imperatives. If you've done any software development for a company, you know that they're saying, get the code out right now. Where's the code? Get the feature out right now. And what we're saying is, that's cool. Get the code out, but it's got to be secure. It's got to mm -hmm. be done in a process. It's got to be done with the right people. It's got to be done in the right way. We've got to build it so that it flows naturally through a secure process. And so that at the end of the day, the data is protected in a way that is legitimate within the standards and con constraints, constraints of, the, uh, of the standard. Okay. And that's a clash of imperatives. Get it out right now, especially for cloud companies that are used to doing things like, okay, it's been a weekend. You don't have the application done yet. Come on, you know? And, and, and so, yeah, we need to get the stuff done, but we also need to do it the right way. And that's what these standards are about. Okay. Yeah. You got to follow the old adage, right? Measure, measure twice, measure cut, twice once. cut once. That's it. Like this is, this is the best way to do it. There is the opportunity to do a little bit of agile security, right? And making sure that they're baked into the process. And I know you laugh because like, what does that mean? Agile and security, total opposites, <laughs> but it can be done, right? As long as you have these processes kind of baked into your sec dev ops, which is the lovely key term um, of the moment, you are able to really making sure that you're implementing the controls as needed so that you can do it in a fast and secure manner. And if you have, your advisor to help you get through that process, you can design an effective schedule to meet those those timelines and get you through the process. Okay. Uh, so there's there's something I wanna I wanna bring up. Uh, I'm actually a prior combat vet, so is Gabriella. So we we've spent a lot of time uh, you know with the DOD and I'll tell you what, if you ever want to fill a checkbook or fill your bank account really quick, go do business with the DOD. But that said, there are some some constraints that are a bit heavier than just FedRAMP that are also tied in. We have IL-4, IL-5 uh, that are out there. And of course, you know, Rev-5 is being pushed. Can we talk a little bit about the, the added security necessary for the DOD and what needs to happen to, you know, really do business in some of these secure sectors? Yeah, so definitely, like, while... Well the DOD is not considered part of the federal civilian portion. They still follow a very similar framework and minimum requirements. I like to call it like FedRAMP with the DOD overlay, right? They're, they still have their own risk assessment process to determine what's, what controls are going to be in scope, 
you've still got to go through and have your independent assessment performed, right? They're still doing all of the same checks and balances and leveraging FedRAMP, um, you know, authorized three pals to conduct those services and getting the validations and checks and following the same framework. Uh, they've just kind of got their own little spin on things. Uh, you've got your your overlay of controls that are going to correspond to your low, moderate, and high data, and then you kind of throw in some overlays on whether it's in the classified environment or not, which are going to get you to those IL fives and sixes. Um, but rest assured, they have a process that's implemented, and it is very rigorous, and they're doing the same kinds of checks and balances that the rest of us are doing on the FedSiv side. So you know, kudos to them. While it may not be as visible or get as much credit, they're definitely whipping people into shape and making sure that, you know, they've got the security implemented. All right. So I, I may be running this thing a, a little bit long, but I want to make sure that we we do cover a breadth of material here. So the the last, uh, you know, thing that I'll bring up before we, we go and head to questions here is, you know, there's there's nothing people love more than, t more than taxes aside from unfunded mandates. So there's a lot of unfunded mandates that have sort of come out here with the the new, you know, national, uh, you know, national infrastructure for cybersecurity, with the, you know, the executive orders. How are we managing that? What what are what are what are we to do here as as simple software providers? Oh my gosh, unfunded mandates could literally be its own episode in itself because it probably will be. Let's be clear. Yeah, I mean, honestly, yeah, because there's so many different aspects you can look at it from. You can look at it from the poor people who are responsible and held accountable in the federal government agencies for implementing, you know, all of the, the latest and greatest mandates. Um, and, and mind you, all of these things are definitely brought to the front so that we can protect ourselves and improve the nation's cybersecurity. Um, but typically you get a mandate that comes in and it's not part of your three year budget cycle, but you've got to implement it this year. So then you've got to check and balances of what your priorities are and shift things around. Something's got to move to the right. Something falls off of the plate. And sometimes you just don't have enough money to get it done. Mm -hmm. But what does that then mean for those poor people that are stuck holding the bag and must implement, right? Um, you do have to be flexible. The one thing I love and carry throughout my life that I learned in the military is learning to operate in Gumby mode, right? You got to be flexible and understanding. You got to have realistic expectations and you have to develop plans and strategies to implement these things. Um, on the vendor side, I feel like a lot of times they get a little bit of an easier break because they have a little bit more of a grace period to implement those minimum requirements when you're going through the FedRAMP process. Um, while the, the rest of the federal government has to kind of rush and implement right away because that's what's really driving these federal mandates. Um, and then our, our poor cloud service providers have to go and develop solutions to, to meet those. So it is a little bit of a dog and pony, right? What comes first? How do you rush to be able to get through the process and support these minimum mandates and pushing back on legislation to make sure that you have appro appropriate timelines to really implement and being realistic? Sometimes it takes a phased approach, um, but collectively, that is why um, the governance and policy structure is so important in things like the executive order that define for the, the minimum requirements for development of policy um, to really detail what needs to be implemented based off of the structure of the high level items that are defined within the executive order for people to go and then implement it. It doesn't happen overnight. It is a struggle, and I always feel bad for people that have to kind of chase their tails to get through this process, because on top of the unfunded mandates, you've got timelines, you've got fiscal year minimum requirements, and you have to be very strategic. So having those open and honest conversations between your federal government agencies and your cloud service providers to come up with standardized solutions that are going to meet these requirements, I think are super important to have that kind of open communication um, to be able to really kind of come up with the strategies to, to solve these problems. There is no answer, though. It is a pain point for everyone that has to go through the process, unfortunately. Okay, and that's, that's typically what you expect from the government. It's a pain point deal with it, right? <sighs> yeah, but I mean, you're talking about More pain points. You're, you're talking about pain points that are actually kind of huge. I mean, just one of those unfunded mandates is requiring people to add potentially millions of dollars to their, their SIEM, their, secure, their security incident event monitoring bills. 
uh, by mandating that they hold every single data point possible for years uh, and, and have them active inside of their seam. That's a lot of money. Like that's a lot of money. That's a lot more monitoring, a lot more logging. It's not just adding to your Splunk bill or your whatever seam bill. It's also adding personnel. It's adding sensors. It's adding instrumentation. It's a significant amount of implementation. So my, my point is that just for that one unfunded mandate, I think there's like five of them in, in there. Uh, there's, it could be millions and millions and millions of dollars of, of uptick in budget and personnel and such. So it's okay. not small. All right. So we've, uh, thank you both very much. Uh, we, we've been so happy to do this. Talking about FedRAMP is really a, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that's important and, and part of all of our careers, but re really important to us, important to the protection of the company, of the country, rather. Uh, and just making sure that everybody understands it is really sort of the goal here. Uh, so from that, I, I want to thank both of you for being here. And then I want to open it up to questions. I've already got a few coming in. Uh, the first one I've got is from Casey, and he's wondering, what is the relationship between FedRAMP and FISMA? Either a favorite F word. <laughs> okay, so FISMA really is required and is another wonderful law against all of our information systems. There is a lot of correlation and overlap between the two. FISMA identifies the need for your risk management framework, for all of your risks to be documented, assessed, monitored, and reported on. A portion of that FISMA report and FISMA metrics does correspond, and there is a specific area that focuses specifically on your inventory that is FedRAMP authorized. How many FedRAMP authorization services or authorizations does your organization have? How many different services do you use? And this may be multiple instances of the same type of capability or solution. I have worked in organizations that had 42 different authorizations for Office 365. There, all of that stuff gets documented and reported and validates again that you've met those cybersecurity metrics and cybersecurity controls um, and gets fed uh, up into the larger reporting process from a, con a congressional mandate. Uh, you are also responsible for identifying any time you deviate from said standard and reporting to the federal uh, CIO uh, CIO's office to define when you are not using a FedRAMP authorized service and why you are deviating from said service, uh, specifically when it is the law, right? And that uh, that all of that information kind of rolls up into the larger understanding of that big picture of risk. And that is why FedRAMP and FISMA kind of go hand in hand. It's that check-in balances uh, and the kind of Bible and end-all of be-all when it comes to cybersecurity risk management processes and having the insight to both on-prem and in the cloud data. Fantastic. I, I, I couldn't have asked for a better answer, Gabriella. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. So I, I have a question now coming in from, from Haley, actually, uh, who wants to know, Time frames. I mean, if it, it, what does it take? Does it take does it take me a week, a month? Does it take me two years? Oh my god, it's like three days. It's not a big deal. Is it, can, I, can I get this day? thing done over the weekend? Is it what? What is the time frame necessary to you know truly make sure that I'm ready? It depends. If you buy a really good craft beer for your assessor, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, in all seriousness. Uh, depending on the level of FedRAMP, depending on the scope and size of your application, the uh, depending on a lot of factors, basically how big is it? How much do I have to go over? Uh, are you doing low mod high? There's a few different factors that go into how much of a pain in the butt is this going to be? Realistically, it goes anywhere from three months to a year, okay, to get you all the way from nothing, zero to hero, from nothing to FedRAMP ready uh, and, and ready to go forward with an ATO. Then it takes time to get a three pow in the door because you, you don't want to schedule them the day after you should be ready because then you're guaranteed you won't be ready. So you need to have a, a gap in between where you're accumulating evidence. You're making sure that everything's running like a Swiss watch or a really bad Casio that got knocked under a tractor. And You're uh, so generous with the three month. I tell everyone out of the gate, you're going to spend a year yeah. right? at a minimum getting prepared, going through the process. 
Um, you know, of course, there is the um, best case scenario, perfect world. Everyone is ready. All my documentation is perfect. Uh, my environment is ready. The credentials are ready. And we're going to get through all of this. And we are all dedicated 100%, maybe six months. No, no. I, I actually, I, I'll be honest with you, Gabby. I've seen a company that did a self-assessment. They did a really good job. They wrote an SSP. They brought on somebody to help with an SSP. They wrote all their documentation. They wrote everything. And it went in about three, four months. Okay. Not including <laughs> bringing the, uh, the, bringing the three power in, but getting them ready for the three power is about three months. Okay. Sure. <laughs> but then I've seen I mean, companies. When I say a year, I'm saying like your full authorization, not just the preparation. Okay, right? okay, valid, 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 valid. Preparation, absolutely. You can get that done 90 days, 120 days if you, your people are dedicated. But from start to finish, you're looking be, at it. I want to be clear. If your people are dedicated and if you've already written all the documentation, we can have you ready in 90 to 120 days. Okay. If you have people like, well, we're doing three other projects. Okay, this is going to take a while. And, and I mean, that's, that's just the truth, you know? Yeah. But yeah, six months to a year, even more than a year in some cases is absolutely correct. I mean, I've worked with clients that are like, okay, we're going to be ready. Oh, great. As soon as we finish rewriting half of our code and mm -hmm. rebuilding six of our modules and, oh, well, that, that might take more than a year. Yeah. Listen, I've had people come in, they get a gap assessment, they review their results, and then they say, we're going to revisit this because we are we don't know if this if we're really ready for this, right? We've got a lot of stuff that we have to implement. We've got a lot of tools that we need to procure. We didn't understand the level of effort. And next thing you know, their plan was to be authorized in nine months, you know, 15, 16 months later, they're like, well, we'll come back to you. Yeah. <clears throat> it really depends. All right. Uh, so we have one more question, uh, looks like from Brian coming in here. Uh, we had spoke earlier about a, a RAR, ready, readiness assessment report. What what does that RAR, there we go, I think I need to do that every time there now. Every time from now on, RAR. Yeah, it's, it doesn't look as good coming from me. You realize he's going to do that on client meetings now, okay? Yes. Thank you, Gabby. Yes, so mandatory requirement. What what is the business what are the business development benefits of having a RAR of getting my readiness assessment report? Again, the, uh, the comment I just made, right? People come in, I, I hear it from customers or potential customers all the time. My boss says we need FedRAMP. We need to have FedRAMP authorized in a year and we are ready. They don't, they come in, they don't necessarily have a customer or business in the federal government. They hear that it is an ATO process and maybe they are not a cybersecurity company nature uh, by nature, or they don't have a strong cybersecurity um, operations group. And this is their first time really understanding what's required um, and the level of maturity to implement all of these requirements. If you don't go through a readiness assessment or a gap assessment, to really understand the maturity and level of effort that goes into this process, you won't know whether this is worth the return on investment, the amount of money that you must invest to meet said controls, to have all of the technology, go through the compliance, manage and maintain it. I tell people that going through that process will help you validate and understand whether FedRAMP is the commitment that you wanna make or not. And really whether you're ready um, to be quite frank, because a lot of people don't understand the rigor of the cybersecurity framework and the controls that are needed. All right, Gabby, I have uh, I have one last com uh, question coming in here from uh, uh, Shelby, and she wants to know what your favorite Iron Maiden song is. Oh my goodness, I knew someone was going to ask me this question, and you're really going to allow it? Okay, so I'm even going to play it because I knew someone was going to ask, and I I want you guys to tell me why you think this is my favorite song because I think that this is absolutely perfect for us to kind of close this out for the day while my child is calling me. The Trooper. I say it is The Trooper because it not, not only was it an amazing year um, where the song came out, uh, I was born in the 80s, but um, it reminds me of like, Typical 1980s, going fast in a movie type of coverage, that type of energy and excitement is like perfect to like kind of rock out to. 
So uh, that that definitely takes me back to my childhood, and I love that song. All right. Well, I, I think that does it all for us here today. Uh, you know, thank you for sharing so much, both of you, and for putting all this together. It's really uh, it's it's been phenomenal to have you guys, you know, sit in and talk about this. I think that there's been some true value that that everyone's gotten out of it, and I, I would advise everybody maybe watch this once, maybe twice, to really understand you know, how FedRAMP is going to affect you. Now, you know, moving on, as we said, FedRAMP, the other F word, this is going to be a series. So we have a number of upcoming episodes, but this is the first one. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please ask any questions and we'll, we'll make sure that we get to them. And thank you everybody for, for taking a look here.